Hello, this is Hayden Scott, Program Manager and Leave Director for EMS University of San Antonio. Now we're going to go over the final chapter for your refresher course, and this is going to go over your ALS assistant skills. First thing we're going to look at is how to set up an IV. Then we'll take a look at applying EKG and defibrillator electrodes. Uh, we'll take a glance at airway management. This includes combi tube um, insertion as well as King Airway, and then assisting with your partner with intratracheal intubation. We'll also take a look at ventilators. This includes the automatic transport ventilator, which is what most uh, services use, as well as the oxygen-powered manually triggered devices. Uh, we'll take a pretty good look at the CPAP, or Continuous Positive Airway Pressure System, uh, as well as assisting your uh, advanced level partner with uh, medication administration. First, uh, we'll look at how to set up an IV. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is some EMTs do have specialized training in starting IVs in the field. However, this will generally uh, fall under your intermediate and paramedics protocols. Uh, the administration set is going to contain the fluid bag. Uh, in the field, you'll have three uh, potential fluids that you'll be putting through the IV, and those are normal saline lactated ringers, and D5W. Uh, these generally come in a 1,000 cc or 1 liter bag. However, some services do carry 250 as well as 500 cc bags. You're going to have your drop or administration set. Uh, these include select three mini drip and macro drip sets. Um, these will be entirely dependent on uh, your service and what they carry, as well as your protocols and your uh, partner's preference. Uh, so always be aware of what you have on board. You're also going to have an extension tubing. However, this is up to local protocol. Some services do carry um, saline locks. Some services don't. In some services, you will attach the uh, IV tubing directly to uh, your IV port. So uh, be aware, again, of what you have on board. In some instances, you may want to consider blood Y tubing. Um, these are mainly your trauma patients. This way, you could administer two bags of fluids through one IV uh, location. You're going to have your start kit. This contains your tourniquet, the alcohol swab, tegaderm, and tape. Uh, you're going to have a selection of IV catheters. For the adults, your average size is 18 uh, to 20 gauge. Uh, for your geriatric and pediatric patients, uh, you may have 22 gauges, 24 gauges. Um, for your traumas, you'll have larger gauges, uh, 14 and 16 gauge. So always be aware of what type of patient you have on board as well as your partner's preference. Uh, also make sure that your sharps container is readily available for sharps disposal. To spike a bag, you need to remove the fluid bag from its plastic covering. You want to inspect to make sure that it is clear and free of particles. Uh, also make sure it's not expired. If either of these things are true, set it aside and select another bag of fluid. Uh, some services require that you turn in expired or um, damaged medications. This does include uh, your bags of fluids as well. So uh, be aware of your protocols and if it's something that you need to turn in to your administrator, uh, be sure you hold on to it. You're going to select the proper administration set. Uh, again, this is dependent on the type of patient that you have as well as your partner's preferences. So be sure to double check with your partner before you pull out and open up a, an administration set. You're going to uncoil the tubing and make sure not to let the tips touch the ground. Uh, you're going to connect the extension set to the administration set. Again, this is um, per your partner preference. Some of them prefer to have the uh, extension set uh, free, and they connect this directly to the IV catheter as soon as um, it's patent. Uh, again, you, you just got to fill your partner out as well as your protocols. You want to make sure the flow regulator is closed. It's the white portion here uh, in the picture. 
you need to roll the stopcock all the way uh, away from the fluid bag as far as it will go. This will clamp the tubing shut and prevent any fluid from leaking through the tubing. Now you're going to remove the protective covering from the fluid bag port on the bag of fluids um, as well as from the spiked end of the administration set. Uh, that would be this portion right here. Uh, you're going to insert the spiked end into the exposed fluid bag port with a quick twist. You do have to use some uh, force to get it in there, however, you need to do it carefully. Uh, if you use too much force, you could actually puncture through the uh, bag, which would make it unusable and you would have to start the process all over again. You also want to maintain sterility. Uh, I, this cannot be stressed enough. Uh, these fluids are going directly into the uh, patient's bloodstream. So any outside contaminants could cause a very major infection. So you always, through any process uh, that's going to become invasive, you need to make sure that it maintains uh, as much sterility as possible. Now you're going to hold the fluid bag higher than the drip chamber, which is this portion right here. Uh, you're going to squeeze the drip chamber once or twice to start the flow. However, be sure to fill to the marker line, which usually sits right in the middle of the drip chamber. Uh, you want to make sure not to overfill it or fill it all the way to the top because this could mask the, uh, the actual drip uh, in the line and makes it quite difficult for your partner to uh, watch the flow. You're going to open the flow regulator. Again, it's this wise portion with the stopcock. Uh, this will allow fluid to flush air out of the tubing. Once the air has completely left the tubing, you want to turn off the flow regulator again um, and set it aside for uh, until your partner is ready to attach it to the IV site. Um, you want to make sure, like I said, all the air is out of the line. Usually it only takes three or four drops to come out of the hub but um, sometimes it takes a little more than that. Just be sure n not to make a mess. Contain as much of the fluid as possible, um, as well as maintain um, uh, hub sterility. Uh, remember, this is going to be attached um, straight to the IV catheter, which is a direct line into the bloodstream. Uh, it's very easy to introduce contaminants into the bloodstream. You're going to make sure that the setup stays clean until the medic is ready to attach to the catheter. Uh, make sure you use proper BSI precautions. This does include gloves, could potentially uh, mean wearing a gown, as well as safety glasses. Uh, there is a very high likeliness of blood exposure during this uh, procedure. Some medics may also draw blood off the catheter before attaching the IV fluids. You can assist them by labeling the tubes and placing them nearby. Usually when you label a uh, blood specimen uh, pre-hospital, you'll use at least the last name as well as the date, patient's date of birth. Uh, try to refrain from putting any more information on that because remember it is protected health information. In some instances, you can also obtain a blood sugar sample off the IV catheter. This is per protocol, um, dependent on protocol as well as partner's preference. Um, you want to use um, absolute caution as well as discretion while you're doing this. Um, it may become a part of your IV setup is to also prep the um, blood sugar monitor as well uh, when you're uh, setting up. Make sure your sharps are promptly put into the sharps container. Do not let them rest on the bench. Do not let them rest on the stretcher next to the patient. As soon as they are removed, from the patient's body, they need to be placed immediately into the sharps container to reduce the likelihood of a uh, sharps contamination. In order to help ensure a proper flow, uh, you want to make sure that the IV isn't wide open or closed for any unnecessary reasons. Uh, nine times out of ten, if you're connecting fluids to the IV site, um, they will run at least at a TKO or to keep uh, open rate, which is a very slow drip. Uh, you want to confirm anything out of the ordinary with your ALS partner. 
Um, if you notice that it's not flowing, say, you know, hey, is this supposed to be closed? Or if it's flowing freely or wide open, um, ask them, do you want to, uh, do you want this to run open, or do you want to shut it down a little bit? You want to make sure there are no kinks or clamps that are closed on the tubing uh, that could impede flow. You want to make sure that the tourniquet is off the patient's extremity, and also that the extremity is properly positioned. Uh, some IV sites um, will become kinked off if the patient's arm is bent, so you want to make sure that it is in a nice, relaxed, neutral position to allow for uh, IV flow. You also want to make sure that there is no blood or, leak or fluid leaking under the tegaderm patch. Um, also, you want to make sure that all tubing, including the IV tubing um, and extension tubing, you want to make sure it's all secured into place just to prevent accidental removal. It's very easy to get it snagged on something and that IV will be pulled out in nothing flat. So you always want to make sure that it is taped down well um, uh, just to reduce the risk of uh, accidental removal. Now we're going to look at applying EKG defibrillator electrodes. Um, in the field, the EKG provides data on electrical activity in the heart. Um, it is used to alert EMS to life-threatening rhythm disturbances. Uh, here you see a couple of uh, examples of what you might see on the monitor. On the left is a nice, pretty textbook um, heartbeat. In the middle is ventricular tachycardia. This is a very dangerous uh, rhythm. And then on the very right, you see uh, ventricular fibrillation. Uh, this is a lethal dysrhythmia that needs to be treated immediately. Um, your five easy steps for applying electrodes. You turn on the EKG monitor. You make sure that the cables or leads are plugged into the monitor. You want to attach the cables to the electrodes, and those are the little sticky pads that stick to the patient's skin. You're going to apply the electrodes to the patient's body. And you see over here in a diagram to the right, um, you see white uh, electrode on the right arm, the black electrode on the left arm, red electrode on the left leg, and green electrode on the right leg. An easy way to remember it is white on right, and you put salt and pepper on a tomato slice. Um, this is just, a, just one of the many mnemonics that you'll hear uh, uh, come out uh, from various partners and so on and so forth. Um, again, you want to put the white on the right, the black on the left arm, uh, the red on the left leg, and the green on the right leg. You also see uh, the lead placement for the 12 lead EKG. Um, more often than not, though, your paramedic partner is going to have to um, place those leads simply for verification. Then you're going to press print or record to print out the initial strip. Now we're going to look at airway management for the basic. Uh, we're going to start off with the combi tube or the dual lumen airway. You see the um, two ports here. This is why it's called a dual lumen. Uh, you're going to see the ports here. This is your proximal cuff and your distal cuff. Um, your combi tube is going to come in two basic sizes. Your 41 French for your patients that are taller than 5 feet. And then your 37 French, which should be used in a patient that has a height of no less than 48 inches. Or 4 feet. Not uh, This is not to be used for pediatric patients. Combi tubes are, emer are used in emergent situations only where you don't have an advanced life support partner present. Or if they have a difficult airway. Uh, you always have to make sure that there is no gag reflex present. The second you put this tube in the airway and it uh, hits the gag reflex, uh, you could cause uh, vomiting and aspiration. It's a very, very big issue. You have to make sure that there is no gag reflex. In order to prepare the combi tube, you should inflate both cuffs to ensure there are no leaks. The blue or the proximal cuff is marked number one. This should be inflated with 85 milliliters of air. Your white distal cuff is marked 2 and should only be inflated with 15 mLs of air. However, 
Remember to deflate both cuffs before you attempt to place the combi tube. You're then going to generously lubricate the tip with um, water-based jelly. Um, every service provides Surgi Lube. This is water-based um, and should be used generously. Uh, you're going to pre-oxygenate your patient with 100% oxygen via BVM. Then you're going to place the patient's head in a neutral position. You're going to insert the combi tube at a 45 to 60 degree angle and turn it midline as you advance through the airway. Proper placement uh, for the airway will place the teeth in between the two black lines, and those are shown here. So you want the teeth to fall right about this level right here. You are now going to inflate the proximal cuff, or blue number one, with approximately 100 milliliters of Aerostar. Then you're going to inflate the distal cuff, or the white number two, with approximately 15 mLs of air. Now you're going to use the VV BVM and attempt to ventilate through the number one, or blue port. During this, you're going to auscultate for lung sounds bilaterally. If you hear lung sounds and epigastric sounds are absent, as well as you notice chest rise and fall. Then continue ventilations, uh, you're using the proper port. However, if the above is not present, attempt to ventilate via BVM on the number two port. If you auscultate breast sounds bilaterally, then continue breast sounds through this port. If, for any reason, that you must remove this tube in the field, um, for example, your patient starts to breathe on their own, then put them into the recovery position and deflate the balloons before you remove it. Remember, always have suction ready though. Uh, removing this airway could prompt um, a stimulation of the gag reflex causing the patient to vomit, which again could in turn cause aspiration. Now some precautions and some considerations uh, for use of the combi tube. You do not want to use on patients with any kind of caustic substance ingestion, any esophageal disease, including varices, um, or any inhalation burns. This could uh, cause irritation and inflammation of the airway, um, further making things difficult. Uh, remember, esophageal rupture, perforation, laceration, and vomiting with aspiration can occur with the placement and removal of the combi tube. You have to be very careful. Tracheal placement occurs at roughly 20% of the cases. Serious issues occur when this is not immediately recognized by not readily ventilating through the appropriate, appropriate port. So always, always make sure that you absolutely hear bilateral breast sounds when you're ventilating through the appropriate, when you're ventilating through the ports. Now we're gonna look at the King Airway. Uh, this is a single-use device for airway management. can be used by trained EMTs, advanced EMTs, medics, and RNs. Uh, however, you do need to check with your local protocols. Um, some services uh, don't carry King Airways. Um, so you just have to make sure what your service uses um, as well as what they allow for your patch level to uh, use uh, as far as protocols are concerned. King Airways can be used on pediatric patients, so that is a definite plus uh, to these adjuncts. Uh, King Airways are a curved tube with a ventilation port between two inflatable cuffs. Uh, the distal cuff seals off the esophagus, while the proximal cuff seals off the pharynx. Uh, the proximal end of tube is designed to fit the standard BVM. This can be used for a wide spectrum of patients from pediatrics uh, into adults. The size of the King airway is determined by the patient's height. Uh, your yellow King tubes are going to be your four to five foot patients. Uh, your red tubes will be for your patients that fall between the five and six foot mark. And the purple uh, tubes will be for your patients that are taller than six feet. Uh, the balloons on each of these, the yellow, um, will be only 45 to 60 uh, mLs of air. Your red requires 60 to 80 mLs of air. And your purple tubes require 70 to 90 mLs of air. 
the indications for a king airway uh, is w are when the uh, management of the airway by providing a patent route in an unconscious apneic patient without a gag reflex. Uh, contraindications to the king airway are responsive patients with an intact gag reflex, esophageal pharisees, known or suspected ingestion of a caustic substance. A uh, precaution uh, when using a king airway, uh, you always need to be ready for the patient to vomit and aspirate as a result of insertion or removal. Um, also, it can cause excess pressure in the abdomen as well. To use the King Airway, you need to choose the appropriate size based on the patient's height. You're going to test each balloon by inflating them to the appropriate uh, mLs. You're going to generously lubricate with water-based gel. Again, Surgy Lube is very readily available. You need to pre-oxygenate the patient with 100% oxygen via BVM with a mask. Uh, and always have suction available. Anytime you are trying to maintain a patient's airway, you have to have suction available. To insert the king airway, you're going to position the head in a slight sniffing position. Uh, if you suspect trauma, however, make sure you maintain C-spine. You're going to insert the king at a 40 to six, 45 to 60 degree angle. Again, as you advance, you're going to turn the tube into the midline position. You're going to advance tube until the base of the connector aligns with the teeth or the gums. To inflate the cuffs, uh, you want to do so with the minimum volume necessary to secure the device according to the size used. Um, this will be marked on each tube. Um, the second you feel any resistance while inflating the balloon, you should stop at that point. You're going to attach the BVM and ventilate with 100% oxygen. Auscultate lunge sounds on both sides and ensure equal rise and fall of the chest. You're going to secure the tube with a commercially approved device. Um, you also want to note the depth of the tube placement. Uh, most markers will be used at the teeth, so you want to measure to the teeth. Uh, you want to use entitled CO2 if you do have it available on your um, ambulance. Document in the PCR appropriately. Uh, this is going to include the item that you used, the depth, and the patient's response. Are they improving? Are they um, decompensating? The, all of these have to be documented appropriately uh, in your PCR. Remember, your PCR is your first line defense in a court. To assist with an endotracheal intubation, um, this is the gold standard in regards to airway management. Uh, that's because these tubes are placed directly into the trachea, and they are direct access to the lungs for oxygen and medication administration. Uh, endotracheal uh, tubes can be placed uh, on patients of all sizes. Uh, adult sizes have cuffs that seal off the trachea to prevent aspiration, while pediatric tubes uh, do not. They are uncuffed. To prepare your patient for intubation, you want to pre-oxygenate the patient with a BVM and an airway adjunct. Um, more often than not, pre-intubation, you're going to use um, an OPA, um, since uh, the patient will not have a gag reflex. Once your ALS provider is ready, you will remove the BVM and the airway adjunct. As the ALS provider inserts the laryngoscope to look at the vocal cords, they may ask you to apply cricoid pressure by pressing your thumb and index finger over the cricoid cartilage. However, check your local protocols on, cri on cricoid pressure or the silicon needle. You may not be able to perform this procedure um, per your protocols. Once the tube is placed and the cuff is inflated in the adult, yeah, you may be asked to attach the BVM and to the ETE tube port and ventilate while uh, your partner listens for lung sounds uh, as well as epigastric sounds. If the tube is properly placed, the ALS provider will secure the tube with a commercially made tube restraint device. Uh, the entire procedure really should not take uh, any less, uh, uh, any more than 30 seconds. Um, 
if it takes any longer than that, uh, you'll have to stop the procedure and reventilate the patient, reoxygenate the patient uh, before attempting again. Special considerations for ventilating the intubated patient. Um, any little movement can displace this tube. Um, as an example, if your patient's teeth are at the 22 millimeter marker uh, when they're initially intubated, um, and you notice a difference, you need to advise your ALS provider. Um, even a bump can dislodge that tube and bring it out, and all of a sudden you're looking at the 20 millimeter mark at the patient's teeth. This is a very big problem. You need to notice your um, you, you need to notify your uh, advanced partner uh, immediately. You want to pay close attention to ventilations. If they fail any different, you need to report the changes to your partner. Uh, any increased resistance and ca indicates that the tube may have been displaced. Anytime the patient is being defibrillated, remove the BVM from the tube. The weight of the BVM just hanging there may displace the tube as well. So you always want to make sure to remove everything from the, t or remove the BVM from the tube um, while the patient is being defibrillated. Uh, you want to watch for changes in patient's mental status um, and report accordingly, uh, accordingly. If they start to open their eyes or start to bite on the tube, you need to notify your partner immediately. In the absence of an IV line, the ET tube is the next line for drug administration during cardiac arrest. You may be asked to remove the BVM for this purpose. Um, be sure to check with your local protocols on that as well. Uh, there are special considerations for trauma patients. Uh, you may have to hold manual C-spine even with the C-collar in place while the ALS provider intubates, uh, simply because it is very easy uh, to manipulate uh, C-spine even with the C collar on uh, during uh, intubation. Now we're going to look at ventilators. Uh, first ventilator we're going to look at is the automatic transport ventilator. Uh, the use of an ATV ventilator requires medical control uh, and is at the sole discretion of the base hospital medical director and must be appropriately documented in the PCR. This is considered an advanced life support skill. The indications for the uh, ATV use is that the patient requires ventilatory assistance in conjunction with advanced or basic airway adjuncts. Uh, the patient requires ventilatory assistance in conjunction with manual airway movements. Contraindications for the ventilator are that the, patient's uh, are that the patient weighs less than 16 kilograms or 35 pounds. Uh, again, remember, uh, if you're talking about patient's weight, you need to be speaking in kilograms. Um, another contraindication is that the patient has a pneumothorax or a tension pneumothorax. Also, that the patient has suffered a blast injury, water ascent injury, or any other injury described as pulmonary overpressurization syndrome. The procedure for using an ATV, uh, once the need uh, for use is determined, assure that all tubing is free of kinks. The ALS will provider will be attempting to determine the proper tidal volume setting based on the patient's height and weight. During this time, you will be providing ventilatory assistance with the appropriate adjuncts and the BVM. Anytime an alarm sounds once the vent is in place, the ALS, uh, you can assist the ALS provider in checking the equipment and patient for leaks, dislodgement, or patient response. However, Always be prepared to assist with ventilations in this event. You may be asked to assist with lung compliance and chest rise with a BVM and the vent. The ALS provider will adjust tidal volume settings accordingly. Assess and manage the airway as you normally would otherwise. Uh, chest rise and fall, listen for bilateral lung sounds, and pay attention to the ET tube for placement, which means you're going to check uh, that millimeter marker multiple times to make sure it is in the same place. If you notice spontaneous breaths, advise your partner immediately. He or she can adjust the settings accordingly. Always check the oxygen cylinder pressure level frequently. Uh, these devices will deplete a D cylinder very quickly. Uh, also important to keep in mind, um, as soon as you get into your ambulance, this uh, 
uh, the ventilator should be moved over to your um, your M tank uh, that is on board as soon as possible. Special considerations: uh, if your patient has COPD, chest rise may not appear full. Advise your advanced provider if you notice this. If lung sounds are absent or are not bilateral, consider the following: assist in ruling out airway obstruction improper tube placement, or an pneumothorax. The ALS provider can check vent settings accordingly. If chest expansion doesn't seem adequate, advise the ALS provider. The tidal volume may need to be increased. If the chest appears to overexpand, advise the ALS provider. The, tider, the tidal volume, in this case, will need to be decreased. For your oxygen-powered manually triggered vent device, um, the advantages to these devices um, is it allows a single rescuer to use both hands to provide mask-to-face seal while providing positive pressure ventilation. This reduces user uh, rescuer fatigue from using BVM on long transports. This has been used in pre-hospital care for over 25 years. The disadvantages uh, to this device um, it does have a high incidence of gastric inflation when used with a face mask. Uh, this in turn could cause damage to the lung structures if not properly cared or treated for. Special unit and specialized training are needed for one uh, for use on pediatric patients. Uh, these devices may also cause barotrauma if used with other ad airway adjuncts. Um, these cannot, absolutely cannot be used on patients with COPD or suspected C-spine or chest injuries. Uh, for use in an abnic patient, you need to choose the proper mask size. You always have to make sure that the uh, mask fits appropriately, otherwise there could be um, leaks or an improper seal. You need to position the mask on the patient's face appropriately. Open the patient's airway and hold the mask in place with one hand while maintaining a good mask-to-face seal. You're going to press the ventilation button until the chest rises. Allow the patient to exhale passively. Now on a, on a conscious alert patient, you need to prepare the equipment by attaching appropriately sized mask to the manually triggered vent device uh, and ensure it is connected properly to the oxygen source. If possible, you can have the patient hold the mask to the face. Uh, you see that pictured here on the slide. When the patient inhales, the negative pressure will trigger the device to administer 100% oxygen per inhalation. Now we're going to look at the Continuous Positive Airway Pressure Device, or CPAP. Uh, this uses continuous positive pressure to maintain a continuous level of positive pressure within the respiratory system. It uses a mild air pressure to keep airway open. The patient must initiate all breaths. Indications for a CPAP uh, device include congestive heart failure, COPD, and pneumonia. The inclusion criteria in which the patient must have two or more of the following uh, are retractions or accessory muscle use, a respiratory rate of greater than 25 breaths per minute, and an SpO2 of less than 94% at any time. However, exclusion criteria, uh, the patient only needs to meet one of these criteria. They are unable to follow demands have a GI bleed or suspected GI bleed, they are apneic, have a pneumothorax, have any major trauma, and are vomiting. You need to assess the patient to determine uh, indications as well as inclusion criteria. Record a baselet side of set of vital signs, including SpO2. You want to apply a supplemental O2 while assembling equipment and place position in the position it place the the patient in a position of comfort you need to explain the procedure in great detail to the patient place the mask over the patient's mouth and nose however some devices are available that have straps to keep the mask in place you want to administer CPAP at five centimeters of pressure reassess patient's vital signs and respiratory distress scale on the OPQRST scale every five minutes. 
check local protocols, notify medical control, and consider advanced life support intercept as directed. Now, if your patient's condition, condition deteriorates, notify medical control and remove the CPAP. Begin BVM ventilation immediately. Uh, you will be able to assist in ALS medications, um, like setting up nebulizers, which include albuterol, atrovent, zopinex, um, etc. These help open up the airways for COPD patients, asthmatics, congestive heart failure patients, and allergic reactions with airway compromise. Uh, you will place one dose or pillow of albuterol, and that is this right here. Uh, this is a unit dose. Uh, as well as a dose of atrovent and a pillow of normal saline in a nebulizer chamber. Um, all of them resemble this, however, you need to read the label to make sure one is albuterol, one is normal saline for inhalation, and one is atrovent. You will attach the oxygen tank and turn on regular to 8 liters per minute. You will have the patient breathe in the aerolyzed med uh, the medication. Um, your nebulizer could look like this and just be a, uh, a mouthpiece, or it could look like this with a mask. Um, either way is uh, an accepted uh, nebulizing system. Um, just be sure you know what you have on board on your ambulance, uh, as well as what local protocol calls for. This concludes your EMT refresher course. Uh, it has been a pleasure. We wish you the best of luck uh, in your career.